what countries, if we're taking a look at foreign direct investment from China to Africa, what countries are most prevalent and why? So I would say um, mostly East African countries, so Zambia, Kenya, Ethiopia, and that's that's in part because of the proximity to the um, you know Asian um, continent on that side, and also just countries like Zambia and Ethiopia have traditionally had fewer alternatives. So we have a map here uh, that shows the distribution of Chinese investment in Africa, echoing what you were just saying. Uh, is this a resource play? I mean, I'm a commodities person, so I think DRC, I think uh, cobalt, for example. Is it resource or is it something else? Well, so it started off as a resource play, right? So China is the only country that has had a very coherent and consistent Africa strategy for over a decade, right? So it initially started off as China needs a lot of resources to power its growth. Now it's becoming more of a sort of soft power, soft influence play, right? So China wants to secure potential markets for its goods, for its exports, right? China is now exporting more to Africa than it's importing, right? Um, and it's trying to secure opportunities and jobs for its state-owned enterprises and its, its Chinese people. And, and Sherry, to what extent is China also exporting ideas to Africa? I mean, I read, for example, someplace, I think The Economist, that said that China is now the second most popular place for college students to go. And the first, by the way, is not the United States, it's France. That's what kind of a challenge is this potentially to the United States? And do we understand that? Does our government understand that fight over influence? Yes, uh, it's a great point. I think we don't fully appreciate in the U.S. the quest for influence uh, that China is making with its soft power deployment of its educational talent and its science and research. Uh, the U.S. used to be the global leader in science and technology and education. And as you well noted, now uh, the Chinese are growing their universities at a very rapid pace. They're deploying their scientists everywhere from the Arctic to Africa. Uh, and those students and those, sci those budding scientists become the next generation leaders in both technology, engineering, education, and eventually governance. So I think this is very, very critical. And they are taking a long view, understanding what the needs of the countries are, whether it's in uh, reducing energy right. poverty by growing their energy resources or providing right. water. Uh, they're looking now at helping provide water in, in the drought-stricken right. regions across much of Africa, right. and that's going to be a lifeline for many of these nations. Sure. Uh, so I think that we're missing this at well, our peril. Well, and, and, and it's clear that China has a strategy with respect to Africa. It's absolutely clear that they have one. Does the United States have a strategy at all, whether it's a long view or a short view? Do we have a view? Well, we have a view that's been focused on our long-term attention to providing um, you know, humanitarian assistance, whether it's education, uh, whether it's health, we've been great leaders in providing health care uh, and combating the AIDS uh, epidemic throughout Africa. Uh, but at the same time, we need to take a longer view as to what these countries need. Now we're focused through the BUILD Act of this administration deploying more private sector investment, which is a good thing. We should be enabling our companies to invest throughout Africa as well. But we need to do so in a strategic way. We need to not shortchange our research and education, our science and technology enterprise, where we have been global leaders for the last 50 years uh, and where we are at risk of, of losing that race. Uh, Amaka, what does Africa get out of this? Are they really going to get that money pledged by China, for example? This money coming in, the race for Africa, what do they actually get? Well, for. I, I, I would say for most African governments, they welcome alternatives, right? Having an alternative source of financing, having an alternative source of soft power, it's welcoming because then you don't necessarily have to go to the U.S. or some, you know, on another European country that typically does have strings attached with their financing or their aid, right? So for most African countries, they welcome the 
alternatives and what they're getting out of it fr um, frankly is mostly the infrastructure right so a lot of the the pledges and you know I would caution on those pledges most of those pledges never actually typically materialize but the ones that do is typically on infrastructure large infrastructure projects that the African governments would have trouble financing on their own right so big bridges and roads and things like that um, and ultimately that helps the, those economies. So, Amanka, finally, not to end on a down note, but uh, there, we've, there have been situations in the past where Western countries have loaned a lot of money to developing countries, including in Africa, and frankly, they've defaulted in the long term. Is there a chance that China will be left holding the bag here? Yeah, I mean, one thing I would say here, though, because this, I think this is uh, a little bit over overplayed, right? There is a rising debt burden across the continent right now, but it's not driven by Chinese debt, right? Um, you know, in the major countries like Nigeria, Nigeria's debt profile is only 10% Chinese debt. South Africa is like less than 2%, right? In places like Kenya, it's a little bit higher. It's maybe 20%. And in places like Zambia, it might be hitting 40 or, or above, right? So, yes, yes, there are places in which the debt, you know, burden is, is driven by China, but it's really not... It's not across the continent. It's it's few and far between, um, and and I, I would I mean I I think that you know to your question about will China be left holding the bag, um, most likely there there will probably take a creative sort of innovative approach to restructuring it, um, getting something back in return. For example, in Ghana they are looking at taking bauxite in exchange yeah. for infrastructure financing. Right. Right? Okay. So I think China would probably find a creative way of getting its value back.